React India. Hey everyone, I'm Josh Goldberg, and I'm real excited to present to you, for the first time I'm ever given this talk, Type Safe Style Systems, the Future of CSS. Ooh, that was a recursion. But hello. In the beginning, <clears throat> back before React and JSX and Tailwind and all these things, we had HTML. Now, HTML was beautiful. Look at this. I mean, there's there's no simpler way that comes to mind for me to generate a document with an H1, a heading one, other than maybe Markdown. But Markdown wouldn't come for quite a long time after. But HTML was plain. We needed things. We needed styling because this is what an HTML document, what you just saw with H1 looks like. It's just a document. And in the original intent of HTML, that's all that was really capable. If you go back into the internet archives and look at some of the discussion boards, it's actually really funny to watch people who were very experienced, you know, six months of experience at the time of HTML, tell other people, no, 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 it's on your own if you want to do styling. That's not what we're here for. We're just sharing documents. Then there was CSS, and I'm, I'm going to ignore style and other little inline DOM attributes like color, because CSS was the thing that revolutionized how you look at HTML within the scope of this presentation. And again, I will gloss over a few things for the sake of keeping it within half an hour or so. But now you could determine the styling of an element using its class, or as we now call it in React land, class name. H1 class equals fancy gives you color purple, background, some hex code, padding, APX, text line center. So you got a nice style page. Yay, we could do this now. Wonderful. CSS was awesome, and it was very exciting when it came out. But it was weak. CSS on its own, or at least the CSS of the late 90s, early 2000s, was weak. It did not have a lot of features. It didn't have an easy way to center content. It did not have an easy way to align contents in a flexible alignment or with a grid all next to each other. So people, perhaps rightfully so at the time, pooped on CSS constantly. If you ever look up bad CSS on Google Images, it's a great time. I can't recommend doing it on all the GIF or like Jiffy or Tenor search engines because there are some vulgarities there. But my favorite reaction for CSS that keeps coming up, I've seen it in dozens of presentations, is this family guy, Peter Griffin <laughs> image, which is honestly what it was like to work with CSS in the early 2000s, back before I started it. It was a nightmare. So people created frameworks in order to make this life easier. Pardon my mouse, that's all over. For example, Bootstrap. Bootstrap was one of the first really big JavaScript frameworks. It allowed you to define, and this is Bootstrap 1 or 2, give or take class names, a set of shared components once for everyone, like a container or container fluid, and then smaller components, or what we would now call in the design systems world, atoms, like buttons and alert messages. And then you could have this nice theme or a nice standardized UI. Fun fact, by the way, Bootstrap was from Tailwind originally. Pardon me. <laughs> Bootstrap was from Twitter originally, not Tailwind. Tailwind came later. And there is an era in web design where basically every website looked like this, or looked like some variation of the default Bootstrap themes, which I, I think is really funny. Now, Bootstrap was built on a set of CSS processors. I don't actually know what Bootstrap 1 was built on. I couldn't find it online. but there was less for a while, then it switched to SAS. And CSS processors allowed you to do things like this. Or in this hypothetical dot less file, or LESS, you might say define an at link color, which is some hex value. And then you might use it in one of your class names. You say darken the link color hover by 20%. So we have this link color, almost like a CSS variable. And then this almost like a function that takes in that variable and uses it. That was great, because at the time, CSS did not have variables. In fact, it wouldn't be for many, many years later that CSS would allow you to declare variables or even start adding in a lot of the utilities we commonly use in raw CSS today. And there's this interesting lineage, this history of CSS coming out first. Then we had SAS many years later, which was inspired by the Ruby syntax, which is why I don't show it in my slides today as to not offend. Then we had less, 
And then we had an iteration or evolution of SAS called SCSS or Sassy CSS, for those who really want to know why it's SCSS. And this kind of mirrors the lineage or history of JavaScript because JavaScript also came out and had some lacking features in it, thereby encouraging us to create some kind of preprocessor, also amusingly inspired by Ruby syntax. But then we iterated on it. We came out with TypeScript and we came out ES Next and uh, Babel, now SWC and ES Build and all these different things that allow you to write more modern JavaScript today and add in features like TypeScript type safety that are really useful in JavaScript. But the features, they eventually did come to CSS and now we have CSS3 with things like display flex. So no one should ever be making a joke anymore about how it's incredibly difficult to center a div or center a DOM element in CSS. At least not these days because it's actually pretty straightforward to center an element. Display flex, align item center, justify content center. Display flex makes it the new flexbox model of layout. One of those aligns it horizontally, the other aligns it vertically. I can never remember which, but I know it's those two together. It's good for me. Voila, a centered diff, a centered h1. So CSS3 is great. And if you ever want to practice your CSS, I highly recommend flexboxfroggy.com. It's this classic game been around since I believe around 2017, 2018 or so, that allows you to practice more and more incrementally difficult challenges around CSS flex. I gotten this one wrong. It should be justified content. Well, you, you, you can figure it out. And this really exposes how innovation tends to work in any fundamental area like CSS, like JavaScript, like HTML. It's this never ending cycle where we start off with better primitives than what we had before. For example, CSS on top of no CSS or CSS3, the initial versions of it on top of CSS 2.1. We then iterate and discover on what the common difficulties are as a community, we realize, okay, now that we figure out centering, maybe we should figure out grid layouts, or maybe we should figure out animations or variables. We have different competing solutions in what framework authors call framework land and what spec authors call user land, things like bootstrap or less or SAS or SCSS. We have all these different competing approaches that are trying to figure out what's the best way to do this thing. What are the user needs? How do we solve those user needs? And then eventually, how do we build those solutions, the best of all the different options into the platform? We see this in CSS where every processor had a different way of doing variables, and now we have actual native built-in CSS variables. We also saw it in JavaScript land with things like classes and uh, modules and arrow lambdas, things that were implemented in subtly different ways by users or in frameworks. And now we have them in the language itself. And you don't have to memorize this timeline, but I want to show it's really interesting, I think, before we start getting into systems and all that a little bit later on, the history of generally what the major CSS and HTML points are that are relative to this talk. Again, this is an overview. It's abbreviated. There are a lot of things here that are very important and I just don't have time to cover. But Exposing my mouse now, at the very beginning, we had a flurry of innovation with HTML3 and HTML4 later that same year. CSS2, I skipped 2.1 on the slides. They started working on CSS3 in like 99, before many of you, I'm sure, were born. And then we had this large gap. And anyone want to guess what was in that gap? Internet Explorer having a monopoly of the marketplace and discontinuing active feature development. Thanks, Microsoft. Glad they don't do that anymore. Then we had innovation, a lot of it around the styling or component space. And then we had all sorts of new stuff. And more recently than this timeline, we're having a continuation of all these awesome new HTML and CSS features. And each of these features was informed by the things that came before it. Bootstrap was informed and helped made possible by preprocessors like less and the understanding of what people were using them for. CSS variables were helped informed by those preprocessors. CSS Flex was helped informed by the container approach in Bootstrap, and of course, many other frameworks at the time. And just 
really one last example of why I'm excited about the framework becoming a primitive lifecycle is that you don't have to use CSS variables in anything other than CSS variables anymore. Those less variables or mixins, those SAS or SCSS ones, they are now platform native. You can define CSS variables and then use them in your classes, in your styles. So just as a quick pro tip, the first little spicy tip of this talk, you probably don't need SCSS anymore. I can't say for sure for you. There are some legitimate use cases for using a preprocessor, things that add in their own equivalents of variables, functions, and so on. But in my experience as a web developer working in open source, as a consultant and previously at companies, the vast majority of things that people use preprocessors for are already now built into CSS. And the vast majority of those things is generally just CSS variables, maybe the occasional mix-in that should really be used as a utility class. So there's really not that much motivation for these preprocessors. There's still some, but not as much as there was before. But let's make it more complex. Let's talk about JavaScript first frameworks. Back in the day, our front ends, our JS first front ends, were built with first nothing and then just vanilla JS. And then we had jQuery. And then we had rounds of things like Backbone and Knockout. And we didn't like that two way binding situation there. So then we made the initial slew of really rich client driven frameworks like Angular JS, Ember, the older React. Then we had another round of Angular and Solid and Svelte and React and Vue and all these other things. Deep apologies to people whose frameworks I did not include here, their personal identities. And we're continuing to innovate past this slide with meta frameworks like Astro and Next and Remix. But the theme through all of these is that they are extremely rich JavaScript driven front ends on our JavaScript web apps. That instead of defining your content purely or mostly within HTML to generate the DOM, and then maybe sprinkling a little bit of JS interactivity on top, you're defining your application in JavaScript, often in something like JSX or an Angular template tag. And the first really common popular approach we had for allowing these styles of yours to be as dynamic and fluid as the content themselves, beyond just including a whole bunch of classes in a file, are CSS modules. Here, because I'm simulating what it was like to code eight to 10 years ago, we're using dollar sign, SAS or SCSS variables, SCSS for sassy CSS. And we're using styles.container. Back in the code, you might see something like import styles from dot slash styles.module.css or dot slash app.module.scss. And this allowed us to have a pretty good amount of JavaScript CSS styling interop, but it got a little hairy when we started making our JavaScript truly interactive. Here I have omitted the import use state from React and const pressed comma set pressed equals use state false. But we have a button whose class name needs to change. A button always has a dot button class, but it has a dot pressed class also if it is pressed. And a lot of people use utilities like CLSX or class names to combine styles together, also omitted from the slide. But this is still fundamentally a problem between paradigms. We have the dynamic rich JavaScript paradigm on the left and the very static, very optimizable, but not super dynamic CSS styling on the right. So then people added something like styled components. On the left is what the resultant HTML DOM representation in your JS or JSX or TSX file looks like. And on the right is what we've imported from styled, this styled, class, which allows you to make tags. And these tags can contain JavaScript, the JavaScript template liberals, which then include a raw text description of your CSS. For those who haven't used this before, this was very popular for like two to three years. And then people started really getting annoyed at them because this is what it looks like for a modern styled component system to have interactivity or say if the button dollar pressed equals a certain variable, you can then use that extra component variable in the style tag to run some JavaScript logic. Here, the button is either color foreground or color background for its border color, depending on the press. And uh, I gotta say, this actually works pretty well for interactivity. 
we've moved basically all greater than 99, often 0.9 percent of the application logic from the very raw static CSS into the fluid, dynamic, exciting JavaScript, which allows us to take in all the fancy schmancy utilities and dynamicism of our JavaScript and apply them in our styles. So this was a good approach at the time. But then we started getting real fancy with our front ends. Uh, look at this beautiful website here, React India 2023 Hybrid Edition. Look at this beautiful person in the middle of the speakers page. Note that the speakers page, or I think this is schedule actually, schedule has the same header as the rest of the site. It's got a dynamic but unified style approach with the font sizing and the borders and the paddings and the colors. So developers today have a lot more needs than they did 10 years ago, five years ago even, because we're constantly evolving what it means to build a modern, beautiful, interactive website. And it's not like we just suddenly shift from one paradigm to the next. We've all always been trying to build large, beautiful, dynamic websites. But the definition of what satisfies us as a large, dynamic, beautiful website slowly gets more and more complex over time. We now today have things like design systems that we need to or want to create, where we have components for our button and our text, our different layout primitives. Whereas 10 years ago, we might have had those, but oftentimes websites just hard coded a lot of those styles in multiple places. So I want to propose that any system we use to generate styles really has four core needs. It needs to be convenient, assistable, refactorable, and themable, as I've typoed in the slide, themable. And I guess also performance is, is a good one. I personally think this is important, but a lot of developers honestly don't really make a decision based on performance. So whether it's cart or cart P, that's important. And I want to dive in. I'm going to stay on this slide to explain what I mean by each of these. The styling system you use needs to be convenient. If you have to generate classes or class names using some other file type, like a .css or that module CSS, that's inconvenient because you're separating out the paradigm you're working in into two. You have JavaScript and CSS. And that convenience doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be all in the same place. Some people find raw CSS to be great. And then smaller or medium-sized projects, it is super convenient. Because if you get to larger scales, like we'll see later with, say, Chakra UI, it can be inconvenient to have to set up a whole system to be able to do your little primitive approaches. When I say assistable, I mean the editor needs to be able to autocomplete and suggest for you what to type next. Uh, if you have, let's say, Tailwind, there's a great extension for VS Code that allows you to start typing in, let's say, B background or BG dash, and then it'll fill in what the available colors are. It needs to be refactorable, as in if you want to change your primary color, let's say, from purple to blue, you should be able to do that in roughly one place, definitely a small number of places, rather than having to manually scrape through each of your styling file areas and figure out what was and now is old and new coloring. And lastly, themable, similar to that, you need to be able to swap out the theme at runtime or be able to at least swap out the theme in your, your build system. If you say go from a dark mode in a certain area to a light mode, that needs to be supported by your system. And yes, performance is good. Good runtime performance, good startup performance, low generating code size. And our style components, carts or cart P, eh, they're not super convenient in that they work well at first, but that dollar squiggly syntax, kind of annoying. They're not super themable unless you're using CSS variables, but then that at the time that wasn't super big and it's still just plain text. So it's not super assistable. There are extensions that can help, but they're kind of hard. So I would propose that we all switch now to talking about Tailwind because Tailwind's an awesome system. And, and no, this, this is not the talk's final section. I promise I will actually talk about something beyond Tailwind. But Tailwind is actually pretty great. And Tailwind satisfies the request of this talk title. It is a somewhat type safe, as in it'll yell at you in some way if you have a weird class. It'll work well as a system because it generates or at least stores colors and other tokens for you uh, when you start. And it's actually really convenient. 
Like this is all you need to do to create a, a height 100% container with centered items using flex and then a similar to before H1 that has background light blue, color dark purple, bold text centered with some padding. But Tailwind starts to fall apart a little bit. Please forgive me, Tailwind fans. I know it's going to hurt you to say this. Because even though it is pretty good at the core fundamentals, I have issues with Tailwind scaling. Because once you get past the very base documentation, which, by the way, is fantastic. Like, truly, the Tailwind docs are one of the greatest doc sites you, we can find on the internet today. Interactivity for Tailwind is still a not super solved issue, not a super solved problem. If you want to say generate a dynamic class name in your React with Tailwind, I've seen components or extensions that try to make this easier for you, but most of the time it roughly boils down to you have a prop such as class name and you provided a string. And the Tailwind compiler will look at any string literal you have in their code base to figure out what class names you have. But uh, at the end of the day, you're concatenating strings together. And this violates a little bit of cart or cart P, just the cart part. This violates the convenience part because now you're again doing weird JavaScript syntax things, which is inconvenient. And it violates a little bit of the assistable part because now it's again string literals, which are hard to work with. So Tailwind is pretty good. It generally supports what folks need. And especially if you have, again, a small to medium sized project, if you don't have a gigantic code base with multiple different themes for a large design system, Tailwind is great. So I don't want to hear anyone here bashing Tailwind. I don't have a view of the chat, so I really hope y'all aren't just pooping all over it and me right now. But please remember, Tailwind is pretty good. Just as Bootstrap was great when it came out and for many years after, and before that, CSS2 and 2.1 were great when they came out and for a few years after. Tailwind's today, yesterday, and tomorrow, wonderful, pretty good. But it's not textured first class. So now I want to talk about systems, finally. Almost, almost three quarters of the way through the talk, we're finally discussing what is a system. There are many out there, and I could have chosen quite a few to show you, but I want to focus today on one of my favorites, Chakra UI. This, excuse me. this is a different approach to building theming or building your primitives. It's not quite as convenient in terms of character count as Tailwind, but a lot of component libraries these days are moving to what many are calling the box primitive or the box component, where the first component rendered here is box, and it has a whole bunch of props, each of which align to some CSS property. For example, flex aligns to display flex, similar to how Tailwind's flex does. It has an align items center, justify content center, and so on. So immediately the box is a powerful primitive that we can start to see as a different way, slightly, of doing things from Tailwind, because this can be made type safe. If you use Chakra in VS Code or similar, an editor with good type system or TypeScript support, you can see that you'll get the same auto completions without using any Tailwind-esque extension. And you can even have systems let you know, hey, you, you typed FL3X instead of FLEX, for example. And then the box can be extended. There's some native chakra built-ins that, for example, like button and heading, allow you to have those same box styles on a component that has its own default styles applied on top or its own semantics. And another powerful thing here is that they often have an as prop where you can define your common styling in your own component, such as with heading here, and then allow the user to provide which tag or which DOM element it should render as. Heading as equals H1. So because my throat is getting sore and I'd like to take a drink again, let's just sit on this slide and look. This is, is I think, really beautiful, and I think a really nice way to do styling. Going a little bit deeper, when we have just that button component, we no longer have to do fancy schmancy string literals or random other shenanigans in order to get our interactivity into the styles. And even wilder, and this is a drastic improvement over the approaches around styled components, is that with these styling systems, it's still type safe and still readable even as you get to these interactive props like border color based on the pressed state. 
click me. So I want to quickly show just as an example of an equivalent between Chakra UI and Tailwind before I dive into the code a little bit and switch to VS Code. There is overhead when you're using a larger system such as Chakra UI. Uh, omitted for time, we have vanilla extract and other approaches as well, styled system, because these are larger, more heavyweight approaches, which means they might not be great for you if you have a very small, even medium-sized application. In Tailwind, you have a really nice way of just defining your module, excuse me, <laughs> defining your module exports in your theme file, and then everything else is allowed to use whatever you define there. Um, omitted from the left is an actual usage like you would see on the right. On the right with Chakra UI, there's an extend theme function. You also need a Chakra provider in your app, or rather wrapping the app component that takes in that theme. So different approaches have different pros and cons, but I want to quickly show off the, uh, the approach here because I think it's really interesting. I'm going to, I'll share the link to this readme, uh, or pardon me, this repository after. But I've defined app contents in this folder. I actually have a folder for all the things I showed so far in the talk, building things up from the beginning. And if we look at the components here, notice that I've got this nice little Chakra UI IntelliSense here, showing that Chakra does ship with TypeScript definitions. Good for you. You've got the Chakra props, which are a TypeScript generic. If you want to learn more about generics and TypeScript. Well, buy my book, Learning TypeScript, rated five stars on Amazon, of course. And as we start to mess around with the styles, let's let's make this color different. Let's make the color, hmm, I don't know, pink dots. And look at this, look at this highlighting. It was auto-completed for us so that we know the variables were allowed are, are just these ones. And uh, fun fact, it looks like we've got just under 200 allowed different colors here. Uh, we start to auto-complete on the component. We still get all those nice auto-completes that we would normally from React. And if we go to definition on color, we see that Chakra has defined tokens for all these different styles of props that one might need. For example, token css.property.color named tokens. So if we go to the color, we see that you're allowed either a global, which is one of these basic ones, like initial or inherit. So yeah, you can use these. That's allowed. Um, but if we go back a few times, data type dot color, which is a named color or current or a deprecated system one, which is, look at all this, all these different colors that we're allowed to use. And you can keep going through the Props. I'm going to spare you the deep dive. But this is fascinating because just to, to show off what this was like in Tailwind, we have, now I have the Tailwind extension help. We have kind of two different ways of writing the same code now. Where in one way, we have this very JavaScript first approach where all the React -y props to our box style components, like button, are somewhat type safe or at least type suggested. And then we have this kind of not quite CSS first approach for Tailwind, but a CSS oriented approach where you might have an extension that can give you something like this nice little autocompletes or IntelliSense hover. But this is a CSS first or CSS oriented approach rather than a JavaScript first or a JavaScript oriented approach. And I just think that's fascinating. So hopping back to the slides here, I want to be very clear here that I do have opinions and now you're going to hear them. But uh, these are all different approaches. Raw CSS, Tailwind, and style systems, kind of the holy trinity of the ways people do things today, each have strengths and weaknesses. Raw CSS is the most direct platform way of doing things. And the platform is pretty freaking awesome. I saw an incredible presentation from uh, Una Kravitz at Google at uh, the React Miami conference earlier this year, where the entire presentation going over all the awesome new CSS features was implemented in HTML and CSS, including slide navigation and next and all this. Wild. So I really want to emphasize that I don't want to hear anyone ever say that something from that holy trinity is universally bad today. Things might be bad long term, 
For example, we might discover that tailwind is bad in 10 years compared to what exists in 10 years. We've discovered that from most technology that's lasted longer than 10 years, that there's some better new way of doing things. Uh, but, but today, the way the industry works today, and for the next few years at least, each of these three things have their use cases, and especially tailwind and style systems like Chakra and others like vanilla extract and so on, have strong positives that have enabled developers to be productive. So it is intellectually shallow. You're not thinking deeply enough. You're kind of making a fool of yourself to just flame on the internet that, oh, this thing is terrible. No one should ever use it. You're not a real developer if. Because plenty of real developers have built incredible applications using any or all of these three awesome choices. Also, pro tip, use a design system. A design system, out of scope for this talk to really go deep, is generally the concept of separating out the portions of your designs that are universal or used everywhere from the stuff that's specific to, let's say, a page or a specific part of your application. I really like atomic design, where you separate at least atoms, like typography, headings, buttons, side nav, and so on, to their own general use components, so that larger scale things, your pages, your templates, your layouts, can use them. You should have general primary, secondary, and so on buttons rather than homepage button, second homepage area button, profile button, and so on. And this is a good approach or a good tip for all three of those. If you see a lot of Tailwind components or Tailwind authored components that have a lot of the same strings repeated over and over again, that's just as bad as if you had written raw CSS where you have a lot of the same properties and a a lot of different classes, or if you use something like Chakra and have a lot of the same props across a lot of different components. Those criticisms are not unique to any of those three approaches, the criticisms of repeating the same code over and over again. All three of those approaches, CSS, Tailwind, style systems, are better if you use a design system to extract the common stuff and put it in one place. Whew. So let's recap. We went over the history of CSS and HTML a little bit too. We talked about older things like Bootstrap and Less and SAS and SCSS. We then talked about why Tailwind is actually pretty good and also CSS is actually pretty good these days. But if you really want to scale, it's nice to use a system such as Chopper UI. Um, oops, pardon me. Um, I started filling out the slide and then realized, just look at Chakra. Uh, <laughs> you can Google all the other stuff like Tailwind and the history of CSS 2.1 and the IE monopoly. But if you're going to get started, I really recommend a lot of folks don't use the system, and I think Chakra has pretty good getting started docs. Anyway, I'm Josh Goldberg. Um, I actually don't even work on this stuff day to day. It's been almost two years now since I've had a job at a company that had me do web platform things like this. I normally focus on static analysis tooling around JavaScript and TypeScript. Most notably, I wrote Learning TypeScript, the O'Reilly book, and I'm one of the maintainers on TypeScript ES Lint, which is why I care so deeply about analyzability. Uh, so if you ever want to talk about styling or systems or TypeScript or open source in general, love, love it if you hit me up. My Twitter handle, Fossadon, Blue Sky, Twitch, and YouTube, and .com are all Josh K. Goldberg, which has been on the slides. Thanks, y'all. This has been a pleasure. And stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you so much, Josh, for such an enlightening talk. I'm sure that, you know, like all the attendees have found it useful. We have had a few questions for you. So I'll take, you know, I'll take mostly two of them if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure, let's do it. Awesome. Awesome. So the very first question is, is there any perf comparison for these approaches that you were talking about in your session? Yes. I hesitate to assign any particularly strong uh, result opinions on these because style systems are still pretty new. Things like uh, Chakra, for example, have been iterating. So while early versions of Chakra actually had some pretty bad performance trade-offs, they've fixed a lot of them in newer versions. But in general, um, two things. One, yes, the simpler your setup, at least conceptually, the simpler the build system tooling you use, more likely the simpler and faster your websites will be. So in my experience, these fast
SS web pages tend to be the smaller ones that just use vanilla CSS or Kwins, and then you get slowed down the more you use systems because those systems come with overhead, especially systems that allow you to inject runtime behavior into your styling. Like if we look at the style components example, where we had the uh, pressed becoming your border color, that's a runtime code that then needs to run. But I second, I very rarely seen the theming or the styling be the performance bottleneck for a web page. Sometimes when you have poorly set up or older systems, startup performance of a web page tends to be poor. But I I really hesitate to assign faults to today's batch of uh, theming systems. A lot of them are very fast or even like vanilla extract have uh, zero runtime or very little runtime performance. So all that is to say, cop out answer, eh, depends what you use. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh, for taking that up. The next question is, how to decide between multiple design systems? So there are a couple of things they might be in here. One is decide which pre-built design system to use uh, versus which design system builder. Um, I would say evaluate what your actual needs are and then go with whatever your team likes the most based on those needs. So um, there are a lot of pre-built design systems out there. You could even consider Tailwinds to be a very primitive, rudimentary one in that a lot of its primitives are kind of common. Although Tailwind really exists at one level below your personal theming, uh, Tailwind provides you a lot of primitives and then you decide which of those primitives to use. Um, awesome. But yeah, it really depends on what your team is most familiar with. Um, I, I don't want to give out any prescriptive advice here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh, for taking up all the questions. Once again, I hope you have a cheerful day. Bye-bye.